I guess what I want to say is that um, I'm not going to have any answers tonight, but I want to share a bit of my own journey and hopefully it will connect with you. And um, I've been drawn to um, rhizoanalysis, um, but I want to really think about theory and practice and how it works together because for me, um, theorising is really important, but I want to know what it looks like in the everyday practice. And so, in Australia, what often happens is that we're busy running around asking how to do it, and we leave the why out. And when we leave the why out, it's really difficult to be able to articulate um, what's going on and also to push back when we feel like things aren't going okay. And so when we start to try and explain what might be problematic or what might work really well, um, it becomes really difficult because we haven't got the language or the words of why. And I think in early childhood particularly um, and predominantly um, as females, when we try to start to articulate those ideas, people see it as coming from a very emotional perspective and so it's not seen as legitimate in the the same way and um, again in early childhood in Australia often people see that um, particularly if you're working in long daycare you don't need a lot of theory because in fact I probably won't even be able to understand it um, which is actually a real disservice and so I think one of the challenges for me um, and one of the reasons why I decided to go full time at the university was that I wanted to start to think about how I could write and talk about theory in practice every day and how it could be accessible. Why do I need to use language that means that I disconnect with people rather than connect? So I hope that that makes um, some sense and that this is helpful. Um, so we are in the 2007 federal election um, campaign, the Labor government promised an investment in the early years and there was this big drive about um, the benefits of the early years and it was a very economic um, approach. And on the one hand, I was really, really excited about the possibilities of this investment of finance and also this investment of really a, a more public image around early childhood. Um, but one of the things that, um, that uh, in fact, with the successful election of, of the Labor government, over then fi a five-year period, we had a lot of initiatives. So you can just start to see the timelines. And they were quick, whiz-bang initiatives. So it was like boom, boom, boom. And it felt incredibly overwhelming. So at that time, um, I was working two days a week as director and kinder te kindergarten teacher in one of the children's centres at the university, and three days a week as um, a researcher and lecturer. So I was living it in a, a variety of spaces. And I became really overwhelmed about how much work um, I was being asked to do. So in principle, I felt like all of this was really important, but the practice was really <coughs> difficult. And so the investment were a lot of initiatives, um, but very little direct funding, in fact, no direct funding to services. So the increase in child staff ratios, again, really great, but the increase of cost in terms of staff meant it went directly to parents. The same as um, this uh, drive to have a more qualified um, early childhood community, again, really important, but the cost would go to parents. But this drive of having more um, qualified people meant also this, this um, push around what it meant to be an educator and the experiences of educators. So with all of this reform, there were a variety of things that um, occurred. The uh, first uh, national early years learning framework, and with that came a whole variety of language. Um, I'm being filmed, so I have to be really careful, but some of it was plagiarised, I think, probably, or borrowed <laughs> from um, the New Zealand context. I'll say borrowed. You can edit that, can't you? Yeah, good. Um, so we had um, language like becoming, belonging. We also had identity, um, which was something that was quite new for many people in early childhood. Um, so there was uh, cultural competencies, there were a whole variety of things, intentional teaching that people started to feel really overwhelmed by. And so there was this notion of that if we have good leaders to support the change and to help 
re-educate or support people to learn about these sorts of ideas and to learn about things like outcomes, that this change would be far more, uh, the transition would be smoother and it would be an easier process. And so um, along with all of these changes was all, also the introduction of, um, or a call that every service, every early childhood service should have a named or nominated educational leader. So this was something that was very new to people. Um, it was also really messy because what happened was that we needed to have a nominated leader under the National Quality Framework and Standards. So it was a regulatory requirement, so a legal requirement. Um, there was no additional funding for this to happen. And so suddenly there were people who were being asked to do it or being placed in the position. And they were saying, but hang on, who am I? This sense of where do I fit in with the rest of the service? So if you think in long daycare, for example, we'd have a director, an assistant director, mm -hmm. we'd have room leaders, and suddenly now there's an educational leader. It's like, well, where do I fit in? Do I answer to the, um, the, the co-director, the second in charge? Do I... And there was no sense of what were the qualifications for this. So, uh, our qualifications would be perhaps a, now it's required that everyone has at least a, a Cert 3 and that could be six months training, it might be online. Um, there's a, a, a diploma, there's um, a B.Ed. and so there was this sense of well who got to be the, the leader and for some people they might be a Cert 3 so it's like well I've got a Cert 3 so what does that mean? There were, in very few cases, there were position descriptions. There was very rarely a position description. So you were given the job, but you didn't know what you had to do. The language and the ideas were new as well. You were suddenly responsible for people that were saying, but hang on, I've had 20 years experience and you're a new graduate or, you know, you're a Cert 3 and I'm a B.Ed. You know, what does this mean? So there was this not only workload, but this pressure of what does it mean to be a leader? And while, you know, this has been interesting in doing this paper where um, I sort of knew it, but even making visible, we often talk, or I have, in early childhood where we say, you know, there's this system for us where it's about a community and we don't have the same hierarchies. But actually, that's not true. There are hierarchies. And when I started thinking about that, I was thinking, so what does that mean? So what we were finding is that um, this was, for me, really resonates around this neoliberal policy agenda where really it's about the successes at the side of the individual. So for people um, implementing the new framework, but also in terms of leadership, it was if I just work harder and if I understand what a good leader is, I will be a good leader. So this sort of very linear progression. Um, or if I've got more years of experience. Do people recognise this? Yeah? Um, and so if I go to a leadership course, then I can be a good leader. And there was this sort of, the neoliberal agenda really starts to link into this, you know, accountability reporting, this centralising of curriculum and standards. And this just really <coughs> felt like it was clicking into place for me in terms of starting to think about what was going on in early childhood in Australia. And this real productivity about, you know, how are we going to um, produce and when I started looking at um, policy documents, I started seeing some language that reinforced or connected to that neoliberal agenda. So, you know, you look at this is on our um, DUR website where it says invest, that this is what's happening in, early, in the early years in Australia. Investing in the health, education, development and care of our children benefits children and their families, our communities and the economy and is critical to lifting workforce participation and delivering the government's productivity agenda. So it was like, oh wow, you know, in some ways it was like, oh thanks, this is a gift, I can use this in presentations to make my link, but it was also a little scary and it was, for me, starting to think about, well, how do I make sense? And this is, again, comes back to this knowledge of how do we get access to this? It's on a website, so everybody can get access, but, you know, if I'm in a classroom, am I going to Google the DWI website to look at what their policy is and how does it fit within neoliberalism? And, and specifically, how does that impact on me and how I understand myself within this context? 
Um, so as I've said, um, this really started to place this um, notion of educational leadership and how does that support and reinforce this neoliberal agenda where the leader is starting to um, really ensure that not only for themselves but others are starting to produce um, good outcomes for children in a particular way. And I'm not saying that good outcomes for children is a bad thing. So I'm not, not saying that it's a bad thing, but I'm saying that some of the effects of what it means for us is that there's pressure on us as individuals to make this work. So if I just work hard enough, it'll be okay. So my workload seems longer, so I'll just work extra hours. There's a lot of extra hours, a lot of people working later, staying back, a lot of people working on the weekends. Um, we've even got some services. One of the requirements is also that all um, children, four-year-olds, have access to 15 hours of preschool. So on one hand, that's not an issue, it's not a bad thing. Um, but the issue is how do you fit in several groups in a traditional standalone um, kindergarten? And so one of the things that's happening is that in some communities they're doing Saturday mornings. So it's this, yeah, so, so it's this, again, how do I fit it in rather than saying, does this work? And not only does this work for me, but also does this work for family? And this is a very um, uh, white working class, uh, I guess, this will show my subjectivity, my family background, but Saturday mornings was always about sport for us as a family. You know, it might not be family together, it might be dad taking me off somewhere, mum taking my brothers off somewhere, but there were things that happened on a Saturday to get ready again to spend a bit of time or get ready for the next week for, for work. So this was, all this stuff's been bubbling. And the question for me when I started to think about this was um, this notion of anyone can be a leader. So, you know, again, this neoliberal agenda is if you just work hard enough, you can be a leader. And the question for me is, can anyone be a leader? And we uh, were funded to do um, professional development. It was a three-year funding for um, supporting, educating people to understand leadership and understand themselves differently. And it was really interesting. All the narratives were, um, I don't see myself as a leader. Um, I um, struggle to be a leader. I got pushed into this. No one else would do it and so therefore I was asked to do it. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, we had some really interesting uh, young women, uh, Cert 3, saying, I don't even know why I'm on this course. All these people have introduced themselves. I'm only a Cert 3. What does this mean? So I wanted to try and shake up this notion of leadership and, and educational leadership to say that it's not simple, that it's, it's problematic. And when we look at things like national quality standards, people are being pushed to be accountable and to report on um, educational leadership. So in the first round of assessments, um, when validators were coming out into centres, the educational leader would be interviewed and they were asked, you know, so what do you do? And people failed because they didn't know how to articulate what they do and it was like, I don't know, I just do it. And it's like, well, no, we don't just do it, but why are people in that situation? Um, and again, you'll see that um, you know, there's very little guidelines around it, but then, um, you know, there started to be some documents that came out where there was notions like um, suitably qualified. What does suitably qualified mean? What does that look like? Experienced educator or coordinator who leads the development of the curriculum and ensures the establishment of clear goals and expectations for teaching and learning. So again, what does that mean? And whose meaning is it? Um, further information, so um, uh, a, it's a person who's acquired the greatest knowledge of educational theories and research. So many people in early childhood are saying, you know, greatest knowledge of educational theories and research, I, I don't fit in here. What does that mean? And for me, I also look at um, whose knowledge, a lot of this, um, the knowledge and theories are Western middle class theories. And so again, in early childhood, in long daycare in Australia, traditionally we have um, women from very diverse cultural backgrounds. So, you know, who get, again gets to be the leader? It's often the white middle class female who is the leader. <coughs> or feels like they might be 
if they feel like they are. There's a plethora of leadership literature. There's lots, and when you start to look at leadership, particularly in primary and secondary and higher ed, there's huge amounts. And there is substantially in, um, in early childhood. Leadership um, materials are not new in early childhood, but the, the slant, I think, is different or starting to shift around the focus around leadership really in terms of driving good outcomes and quality outcomes for children. And so when you lead, uh, read leadership literature, there's a lot about traits, behaviours, styles, and there's a variety of different, you know, transformative, distributed, intentional, all sorts of ideas. But one of the things that I started to really think about is, what's the literature that starts to talk about leadership and power? And there is um, substantial amounts in, again, primary, secondary and higher ed, but there's um, a very small amount within um, early childhood. And so this has really, I guess, driven me to start to think about um, what that means. And Chris Whedon, uh, a feminist post-structuralist, um, who's been quite um, influential in, in helping me think about things, she says, at the heart of the mechanism of power, um, knowledge lies the education system within which selected individuals are initiated into literary discourse, taught to read in particular ways and um, to specific ends. And so it really started to make me think about things like leadership and knowledge and what knowledge you have to have and which discourses are involved in that. So my rhizomes. So I'm just starting to have a, a play around rhizomatics and um, I use this in my PhD work to look at um, observation. So this is the first time that I've uh, used it to really think about leadership. So bear with me and uh, questions are really good and thoughts and who knows what direction it might take. So are people familiar <coughs> in any shape or form around rhizomes? Yes, yeah, so some people are, some people aren't. Okay. So. What I wanted to start to think about is, rather than thinking about this linear progression, so to be an educator is to um, think about coming in, having particular knowledge, learning more, getting some experience, then I'm going to be a good educator. You know, you often see that in terms of a career path. I wanted to disrupt that and think about how I might look at the multiplicity of what that means and navigate it in a different way. And um, I wanted to, when I talk about multiplicity, what I want to do is not think about it in terms of numbers or ways of looking at it in multiple ways. I want to look at multiplicity in terms of numbers of different ways of understanding. Yeah? So Deleuze and Guattari are really interesting when they start to talk about um, particularly um, um, thinking about tracing and mapping. So when you trace something, so how many people as a child, this will be showing my age probably, um, baking paper, where you have a picture, yeah, and then you put a piece of baking pa paper over the top, uh, and then you trace. So you get the same picture as underneath. So often what happens for us is that if you think about discourses, we'll get a new idea and it gets laid over the top and you trace, it's the same discourse, it's the same messages, it might be different words, but it's the same meanings or understandings. And what Deleuze and Guattari, or my interpretations of them are, is to say rather than tracing over the top, to just keep <coughs> retracing the same meanings, the same ideas, only using different words, that we need to actually place other text, other ideas, to create a different map, to take new directions, yeah? Is this... People can ask questions along the way if you, if you want to. Um, so this is, I'm not particularly artistic or um, uh, IT savvy, so that's my one hit at trying to show the tracings. But what you want to do is when you, put a, when you put another piece of text and you choose the text to put over it, what you're doing is you're creating ruptures or questions. And when you create a rupture, what you're doing is you create a new line of flight. Do people, do you have ag agapanthers here? Yeah, the yeah. plant, yeah. So if you think about pulling, a, pulling the agapanther out of the ground, which you wouldn't do because it's not environmentally friendly, although I have heard it's a weed, you look at the root system and it's like this, yeah? 
you can't see a beginning or an end. Deleuze and Guattari talk about middles. So when you're tracing different meanings, different discourses over the top, what it does is it creates ruptures or breaks in that root system and the root system doesn't automatically um, grow back into the same line, if you like, as what it was going to. It'll take off in a new direction. So this new lines of flight is about creating different meanings other ways. Yeah? So what we don't want to do is re-inscribe or retrace. Yeah? So this is where... Um, it's interesting to think about. So I'm really drawn with, I've had some really interesting conversations today about feminist theories and I'm really interested in, um, in the Australian context, um, we've had some amazing feminist writers in, in Australia in early childhood and we've still got some in there but people are retiring and, and it feels like, um, uh, in fact Dita you said, you know, we're not celebrating feminism in the same way and I'm not sure whether for me, I ever had. You know, it's probably been in only in the last 10 years that I've actually sort of said that I'm a feminist. Um, and so what's that about? And how might feminist theories start to rub back or push back against some of these neoliberal agendas to say, hang on, this is not about the sight of the individual as a leader not coping or needing a new... Um, program or a new book or a new um, training session that this is actually unfair and inequitable work environments mm -hmm. for people because you're asking a workload and would it happen in the same way if it wasn't in a feminised industry? Would, would it be put up with in the same way? Would we not say out loud and push back? And so I'm particularly interested in feminist post-structuralist theories because I want to know about the multiplicity. Um, but really the power relationships um, in terms of gender. And I'm particularly also interested in, in feminist post-colonial theorists um, to think about um, race and gender and power and, and what that means. And um, I really like this quote in terms of text are worldly, to some degree they are events um, part of the social world, human life, and of course the historical moments in which they are located and interpreted. So I want to think about today as an historical moment to think about how do we reinterpret, how do we rethink um, how we're understanding what's happening in leadership. So, right, I chose a piece of text um, to start to create my rhizome and you know I'm not particularly creative or artistic in any way and, and it will play out and there could be tears because I've had, tried to play with uh, technology which is never a good thing for me. Um, I chose this text because Jill Rod um, has been a, um, a, a very influential uh, person in early childhood, particularly in Australia, around leadership. And so she has been writing in that area and her, um, particularly her, her, one of her books has been published and republished over the years. And so this is not to say that her work isn't important, so I'm not saying that it's not important, but what I want to do is start to highlight some of the discourses in operation to say if we only rely on some text, some knowledge, then it can be problematic. So part of my rhizome is that I take a piece of text and then I start marking that text um, to start to look at um, what's going on and what's being said about leadership. So you'll see here that it's about a set of certain standards, expectations. So remember what I was saying about neoliberalism? and around the reporting of standards and, yeah, so for me, again, it was starting to say, okay, what does this mean? It's expectations and influences the actions of others to behave in what is considered as a desirable direction. Yeah, so, um, and then leaders possess, possess a special set of somewhat elusive qualities and skills, which again started to think about, well, if they're elusive, I'm also supposed to know what I'm doing, so what does that mean? And then further down it says, they are also responsible for setting and clarifying goals, roles and responsibilities, collecting information and planning, making decisions. So again, for me, it started to make these connections around the neoliberal agenda. So, 
I started thinking about, so leaders are about setting rules and expectations and that setting standards as, and it starts to establish the right, wrong way. So this is the way we do it, this isn't the way. And this is the way, um, so it's also this sort of um, visionary icon, you know, so you're going to inspire people to do things um, and lead them in the directions that need to happen. But there's also constantly this thread of that a leader is the holder of expert knowledge, attitudes and qualities. You know, and as soon as I look at that, I think, wow, I can't do any of that. You know, like how is that, you know, it's hard to connect with that, to think about who can I be. I can think of, I can name lots of people that I could see, but would they name themselves in the same way? So even think about the lead, people that you see in your own lives that you would say are leaders, are they comfortable in being named leaders and why? So this is where there could be tears, okay? <laughs> so what I wanted to do is start to, what I thought I'd do first is do a tracing. So remember I'm going to remap the same discourses. So I chose some text from another leadership document in early childhood. Yeah, which says effect, effective school leaders set examples for staff and others. Yeah. So then I chose another that says the second key capacity of a leader is the capacity to influence others into action. Yeah, so if I trace, if I draw on leadership text that keep giving me the same discourses, I'm going to get the same messages. This is what it means to be a leader. My hand's going off to... Yeah? So, all right, this is um, where it could be tears, but we'll see. Okay. I, woo so, mm -hmm. what I decided to do was to um, draw on Chris Whedon because, again, as I said, she's someone who's been really influential for me to start to um, shake up what this means. And so, Chris talks about Knowledge of more than one discourse and the recognition that meaning is plural allows for a measure of choice on the part of the individual and even where choice is not available, resistance is possible. I thought, oh, what does that mean for leadership? So what it does is it starts to say or it starts to raise questions like, can a leader be the good neoliberal subject reporting on standards and outcomes and engage in multiple discourses? Is that possible? Particularly under the national quality standards where you've got to report on particular outcomes. You know, can you look at multiple knowledges? What does that look like? Do, um, how do leaders choose whose standards are privileged? Um, do you get to be a leader if you don't enact the standards that are um, appropriate and measurable within the national quality standards? Do you consider yourself a possible leader if your knowledge is different or alternative? So it starts to shake that up. Where there are um, sites of resistance, how does neoliberal ideologies push for more training or intervention? So if it's different, does that mean you just haven't got it? You know, have you heard that where you say, I've got a question about that? And I say, wow, OK, well, I'll give you some literature, read a bit more, or you might want to come to this course. It's really interesting. So this started to really sort of state, OK, now, all right, ready? Oh, thank you. <laughs> One of the things about a rhizome is that it's supposed to be this sort of living, moving sort of thing, and it's really hard to do it on a flat surface. And it's, it's oh, there you go. Right. So then um, I started to look at um, really thinking about, uh, from a feminist post-colonial perspective, um, and Ng Ang is a, an interesting um, writer who is an Australian um, writer, and she wrote um, particularly, um, the way difference should be dealt with then is typically imagined by feminist establishment through such benevolent terms as recognition, understanding and dialogue. And I think dialogue is a really interesting word because it's something that we use a lot um, in early childhood in Australia. The problem with such terms is first of all that they reveal an overconfident faith in the power and possibility of open and honest communication to overcome or settle differences of a power-free speech situation. 
without interference by entrenched uh, presumptions, sensitivities and preconceived ideas. And so for me, that again created this new rupture, if you like, a new way of thinking about how do I navigate as a leader and think about the multiplicity of knowledges and how do I um, think about how I talk about dialogue and how I use dialogue as a way of coming to consensus, if you like, about something. And if I can't, who gives up what knowledge and what power? So sometimes there's bottom lines we have to do, you know, there's, there's, there's no choice. But is it the same people that are always privileged, the same knowledges and the same people who are always silent? So for me, and I was going to try it, but it was just, there was going to end up being tears and so I just couldn't do it. But if you start, I know, it's, it's tragic, but I was trying really hard to do it. But for me, it starts to create these lines and connections and disconnections to start to think about um, what does it mean? And so is this connecting with people? Is it making some sort of sense, whatever sense means? But it's, it's so a rhizome, I don't, for, my, for me, I don't think it's about having an answer to say this is a new recipe. And I think that Deleuze and Guattari would actually um, shudder to think that that's what we were doing. But I think what it is is to start to um, create these moments of almost light bulb moments, these cracks to say, wow, I, I speak in that way. Why do I speak in that way? And what other ways can I speak or understand or importantly listen? So how am I going for time? I'm all right? Okay. Um, I'm going to try and do too much in, in a short period of time. So, so it starts to raise questions about, again for me, who gets to be a leader? And um, Jill Blackmore's been really interesting uh, feminist writer where um, she talks about leadership was perceived to require doing things differently as different from teaching and um, previous change work. And often people are saying, you know, I want to be in the classroom with the children. I don't want to be a leader. They see it as external, that it's outside of what they do. Um, whereas leadership is often constructed as he um, heroic work, women read these contradictions and discomfort as not coping rather than the norm. And so how does that resonate with you where you feel like you're not coping, you haven't got it right, so you can't, you're not the good leader or you shouldn't be a leader because it's uncomfortable or it's a mismatch? And how do visions or dreams translate into realities when we're reporting on outcomes? Um, so, you know, I then start to look at the, the next piece of text from Rod's work where it talks about this elusive quality so if I'm going to, so I'm doing a tracing now. So I then pull out um, some other work where it's when we think about standing leaders, words like vision, motivation, and strategy come to mind. So again, I'm not saying that that's not one truth. But and then I started thinking about people like Martin Luther King. So when you start to think about these leaders, they're these icons. You know, so how do I aspire to be an icon, um, you know, and to have a dream? And are you allowed to have a dream in a neoliberal environment where you've got to have a good outcome and report on it? Yeah, so it's so still, how do you still do that? So, you know, that's important too. But how do you do that and also have a dream? Yeah? So how do you bring them together? All right. Um, so again, I was drawn to um, uh, Chris Whedon's work where um, she starts to talk about the dominance of um, discourses in Western society and assumes the um, unitary nature of the subject and conscious um, subjectivity. So this real sense of that you can have a uniformity and so even with the dream, that if you have the dream, what's that, uh, there was a movie, you know, if you build it they will come. You know, there's this sense of that then there's unity, that if we're all, if we all believe, we all believe in the same thing. So can we believe in the same thing but be different? You know, so you can have a, uh, you know, because I was thinking, I would argue that every, most people in early childhood want really the best outcomes possible for families and children and our co-workers. 
But what best possible outcomes or best possible worlds will look different for each of us. We'll all speak it slightly differently. And we might use the same word, but we might mean something different from that word. So how do you start to think about rather this sort of unitary, objective, rational understanding and think about how it's subjective and shifting and changing? Oh, okay. Um, and again, Ying Ang says, um, it is a faith in our limitless, no, uh, our limitless capacity not to only, uh, only to speak, but more importantly, to listen and hear. And Spielman, speaking to fellow white feminists, relentlessly questions the white feminist ability to listen in this regard. Is the reason we haven't heard from them before that they haven't spoken or that we haven't listened? Are we really willing to hear anything and everything that they might have to say or only what we don't find too disturbing? Are we prepared to hear what they say even if it requires learning concepts or whole languages that we don't yet understand? So again for me that text starts to create ruptures and starts to think about, I start to think about things like, oh there you go, um, where to go? Um, how do I listen, how do I filter what's being said to take up and how is it possible to listen differently again when we're being expected to um, operate within particular standards and guidelines? How do we push back against it? How do we explain using some of this text the why of how we're doing things differently or how we're doing things multiply? So yes, this is important because Bromf and Brenner talked about it in this particular way, but actually, yes, this is really important too because Chris Whedon talks about it in this way. Yeah? Okay. Oh, we'll just move on, we won't worry about that. <laughs> so again, it starts to raise questions. Um, so for an educator, what does it mean um, if you train or you have years of experience but you still don't feel that you're visionary, inspirational, that you're not innovative. Um, how is what the leader hears filtered and in my case with a white lens? Do women of colour have to give up non-Western knowledge and take up the colonisers' imaginings and knowledge to be a leader? And who gets to be a leader and who doesn't? And how might racial and ethnic identity play out in this? I'd love an answer for you. And please, jot down the answer and pass it to me at the end. But I'm going to do, have we got time to do one more? Yeah, OK. So again, I'm going to do another tracing. OK, so this is really about uh, responsible for setting and clarifying goals, roles, responsibilities, collecting information, planning and decision making. And this really fits in with national quality standards. We need to be able to document and report on the outcomes. Yeah, And if you don't, then you're not successful in terms of your quality um, indicators. So Cheeseman also talks about knowledge of theories, learning and development, knowledge of curriculum, access to current research and curriculum, knowledge of individual children and learning, personal qualities and willingness to listen, as well as coach, mentor and reflect alongside each other. So again, yes, all of that. Um, Dunlop again talks about, and um, Jordi Bloom talks about the, the leader again as knowledge. Um, skills, attitudes. So, so um, this is the first text comes up from um, a, another post-colonial feminist post-colonial um, writer, um, who says, retrieving the voice and experience of white women in, in uh, colonial settings, these histories place it alongside the existing male narratives as an autonomous account of the past, while the histories of the colonised male and female are presumed to be another different project, by implication awaiting the uh, attentions of native historians themselves. Difference thus remains a mark of defiance from norm, rather than the concept, um, concept disrupting um, the complacent authority of dominant discursive presence. And this work I was starting to think about, particularly around power, and I've just recently um, 
recently started doing a women in leadership course at the university and um, a really interesting reading um, by a person called Sinclair and she started to talk about power and how um, we're disengaged with the idea of power often as women because we see it as corrupt or ugly and how does power fit within leadership and how do we disassociate ourselves from leadership because of this notion of power as being corrupt and often seen in this very masculine hierarchical sense. So, you know, to be a good leader, you need to be tough, you need to get the job done, you need to be hard with people, come to decisions, get it done, all that sort of stuff. And this notion of then that if we step back, that we're powerless. And so someone like Foucault would say, we're never powerless. And why don't we actually say out loud that we would like to be powerful or that we have power? And so, you know, my, my I guess, imaginings in doing this work is starting to think about power. And if we don't start to think about power as also something that is not corrupt, that is really important and desirable, and that that doesn't place us in a... Power can be... Um, not great if it's used in destructive ways, used to silence people. But how might we think of power as being attractive and desirable because it gives us a voice, it also supports the voices of silenced people, or maybe it's not about us having power, maybe it's about shifting power and thinking about how you listen differently so that other people can enact their power. Yeah, so think about them as choosing to act um, in different ways rather than us giving power because that's another colonising mm. attribute. You know, as, as a white woman, I now hand you power. You may have it. It forgets that whole history. So um, it is this sort of um, sense of disruption. Um, I'd love to be really graphical and, and artistic to be able to, you know, have things look a little different. But it is... In doing this paper for me, what it did was it gave me space to draw on some feminist um, writers and multiplicity of feminists. So we were talking today about, you know, this sense of feminist theory is this universal sense. But there are multiple feminist theories. And so, and there are other theories. So what other theories would you use to create ruptures that don't retrace the same dominant discourses, but that that bring in different other knowledges because there are so many different theoretical perspectives. These are just two that I'm drawn to because I want to make sense of why as a feminised industry we're not using um, or making visible feminist theories more um, or acknowledging them more and how might this um, help us. So um, Again, you know, for me, how does scientific knowledge become privileged over lived experiences as well? So if you're thinking about leaders in early childhood and if you're thinking about expert knowledge, then where does lived experience come into that? Because in Australia, particularly again in uh, long day care, in out of school hours um, care and family day care, um, the qualifications are not necessarily high, but the lived experiences are really, really rich. And so how does that um, fit into um, a neoliberal environment, which is actually they need to educate themselves more to be the good neoliberal citizen? How do we understand concepts of power? Because there are diverse understandings. And do we see um, power as ugly and corrupt? And how else might we um, see this? And is white privileged knowledge ever named? Do we ever name it? And what would happen if we did? Gail Canella says, as a construct, as a construct um, professionalism drives, derives social authority by laying claim to the truth of science and the assumption that only a particular group of individuals will learn enough to administer knowledge. And for me, that sort of connects with the educational leader. Further enlightenment and modernist beliefs in truth as existent, predetermined and universal lead to an, an asocial, acultural construction of professionalism. And I would say you could replace professionalism with educational leader. I'm not sure whether Gail would, but... So I want to um, 
I'm mindful of time, so I want to uh, finish with these questions to open up some conversations. Do you see yourself as a leader and why or why not and in what context? Um, how does the New Zealand context, I was looking at some of your documents, some good text in there, um, how does the New Zealand context connect with Australian neoliberal educational policy discourses? And what text might you draw on to map alternative discourses to create new lines of flight? And how do you understand power and what it might mean for you as a leader or how you understand the person who is leading you? And how might feminist theories help to push back against neoliberal policy to open up fairer spaces for children, families and ourselves? And I think that's really important because I think we're really good at advocating for families and children. I don't think we're so good at advocating for ourselves. So thoughts, ideas, questions? Silence. Mm -hmm. Can we just invite the people? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll leave the questions. Okay. Up here. Beautiful. So thank you. Thank you, Kylie, for um, really um, uh, inspiring us to think about what lies under leadership. At no point did you define leadership. No. Which um, was um, excellent. Um, in a very short time, you introduced us, you talked about theorising practice and practice and theory. In a very short space of time, um, I thought you very clearly outlined Deleuzean theory and the idea of um, this idea of cartography and then, you, you know, and then looking at mapping and, 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 and looking at different discourses and um, avoiding the reinscribing of um, existing discourses. Um, there's been a lot, actually. <laughs> yes, sorry, too much. Questions, but there's a lot to actually think um, to think about. I think the New Zealand situation, and I mean, I want to hear from other people. I think New Zealand situation with the election, our election coming up on September the twentieth, um, is very um, um, is very foremost in our minds at the moment. I mean, we've had a national government for quite some time, and I think that neoliberal discourse is there. It's interesting that we had that very brief exchange about celebrating uh, um, feminist discourses um, when we, you know, over um, over lunch. Yeah. Because I don't think we spend that same time as we maybe did in the past over celebrating anything very much. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we even could offer ourselves the time to actually. Um, avoid reinscribing, um, you know, dominant discourses. Um, I mean, I particularly like I wrote it down. The um, Anne's quote it is a faith in our capacity not only to speak but to listen and to hear. And how do we understand that sense of disruption? Do we even offer ourselves the time? So, I mean, so many other questions. I mean, I've just made lots of notes, but I thought you've got the questions up there. So, um, um, any any thoughts? But it's interesting to think about theoretically, like, does it belong to everybody? Mm. When yeah. we start to look at power and yeah. gender, culture, race, class, yeah. education, yeah, it does, it. does it belong to... But it should. <laughs> but it, yeah, absolutely. I think it's an important quote, yeah. but it, I also think that it, it can be... Um, in some time, sometimes easy to think, yes, that, that it, it is only that. And so, yes, the ideal is that it should be, but is the reality, I don't know. But I'm just wondering that even if you do um, ask um, yourself, you know, is a leader a good to be a singer or an artist? Mm -hmm. You've still got that issue, which you didn't haven't come back here to dreams and visions, but mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's that idea of is this visionary? Is this mm -hmm. is this what I really want to be? Is that you know because that's often seen in a neoliberal environment, mm 
Dreams and visions don't have strong plans. Mm. Mm. You can't report on dreams and visions. Mm. Can you? Yeah. Well, you can, but but it, not in not in scientific ways necessarily. Yeah. It narrows what can be a good dream. Yeah. I think that's what it does. Mm -hmm. well, I like your last bullet point there, um, and you've highlighted the word ourselves. Um, and if I was, I was just saying, Sandy and I have just been working on a piece um, where we explore our position in the university, and we got that Stephen Ball's idea of the neoliberal beast who wanders down our um, corridors from asking us to give account for ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we use this word ourselves here, and I think this this might be part of the issue in our in this tension, is are we talking about I or us when you say mm -hmm. ourselves? And it's that issue of is, are we talking about the individual or are we talking about the group? Um, because this is where I think a lot of teaching comes for us that when we work in a collaborative way or we mm -hmm. just think about ourselves and our future. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. And that's interesting to think about if you think about neoliberalism, it is supposed to be the side of the individual and so you start to lose the, and you think about um, early childhood but you think about universities and we're so busy competing for dollars and funding and promotions and a variety of other things that we do start to think about ourselves as in the individual rather than what does it mean in terms of a community and, and that starts to get um, tricky. You say was drawing on Deleuzean theory was opening up the cracks for dialogue, mm -hmm. looking for the cracks mm -hmm. for dialogue, and I think sometimes we just don't see the cracks because the cracks aren't presented to us. And I'm talking about us as a collective. Um, so we've got to search for the cracks, and then and then open up dialogue from there. So it is mm -hmm. about. As a early childhood leader in my particular early childhood centre, you know, there's a lot of conflict in there for me because I can look at it in lots of different ways. I can celebrate some of those ideas because as a team, we can actually have the freedom to celebrate and look at other ways mm. of meaning. But then I actually, then I lose it in the hierarchies that I have to work, A, work for mm. and the politicism of what I'm looking at, maybe, you know, national standards coming from a way bigger hierarchy than what I'm going to be able to fight. So, you know, like for me, it's just that I'm like, one sentence will put me up and the other one kind of depressed me, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's the New Zealand context for me. But, I mean, one of the things that um, I think is really, I mean, it was, it was, this is sort of one of the reasons why I decided to go full time at the university, because I needed space outside of the children's centre to try and make sense of the everyday and the realities. Um, and be able to talk about the why I was uncomfortable with it. And I think it's about um, making visible all of that, that, that leadership is complex and it is dealing with hierarchies. Hierarchies do exist and there are particular things that we're bound. And it is about being a visionary and celebrating and it is about all of these things, but, it's not, but there's no recipe and it's going to look different for each person and you're going to live it differently because of who you are and your histories and it's going to be different today and it'll look different next week, it'll depend on the elections, it'll look different again. And the problem with that multiplicity is, is that there's not one answer. And you know, some days you need, the reality is you just need a good recipe and an answer to survive the day. So it's about navigating and choosing the moments that you create cracks and ruptures and other times that you take the smoothest path. Because the other thing is that we're all in different positions. So I can speak this in a privileged position because I don't have kids and I'm not paying school fees. So if I lost my job tomorrow, I'd be okay. I've got family who would support me short term and I would be able to get a job. It might not be my dream job. So it's also this, when we speak to these things, we also need to be mindful of what position we're speaking from because for some people they do need to be a good leader. It's the only time they get to be expert in their life. Or it's the only way that they're going to be able to keep their job and that's about survival. So it's also about the realities of theory and practice and playing with these ideas that are all great and, and quite romantic and exciting to, to create ruptures, but actually some days you need an answer, some days you just need to take what might seem the easiest path and it might not be fair for everybody, but it's about how do you make that visible and say, well, this is what I've done today because this is what I can do today.
at some point there was some sentence about values, values and attributes, and I think that you know there needs to you know that's that's a hard one to sign to fit into a context of, because of whose value and, and whose meaning and, yeah. and who values what you value and yeah. how does that fit yeah. into the hierarchical system, you know. Because yeah. As years of my teaching have gone on, I found that I had to actually fight to get my values heard more and fight to get yeah. my meaning heard more. Whereas before, I actually used to have lots of like-minded people around me, and I can yeah. feel the divides coming yeah. all the time that I'm actually advocating and fighting to get certain values and yeah. meaning across that don't fit. You mm -hmm. know, which in the same way, growing as a leader in some ways, yeah. but there's just that constant conflict. So if you think about text, if that text is a really good example of creating rupture, where you start to talk about being a leader as fighting for things. You know, like that's a really... So also think about being nomadic about your text, that it doesn't have to be a piece of theoretical text or a piece of public text. People's narrative texts create those really interesting ruptures about what's possible when and what's not possible when. So, I mean, I think you've just given a beautiful example of a text that that pushes back but also shows the realities. How important for problem solving if you have the time. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got the luxury of time, that thinking in that way yep. can provide creative new solutions. Yeah. So you know how do you rethink staff meetings? Mm. You know, how do you put your housekeeping things at the end of a mm. staff meeting? Because you can guarantee you'll get it, get it all resolved and out on time. And how do you create some space to talk and listen and engage with some ideas differently for the first part of your, your staff meeting? So it's that we're never going to get more time. And if we do, it'll be our own unpaid time. So how do we tweak and shift the time we have? And part of that's the pushing back or the, the, the you know, about being powerful to say, actually, we're going to do this work here and this stuff might not matter so much, or we'll get all of this done this meeting so that we've got space to do this in this meeting. Isn't that also part of the resistance, though? Yeah. The resistance you were talking about is actually to, to, to challenge something as simple as a staff meeting. Um, I, think, I think neoliberalism actually plates up those opportunities for dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's part of, the, part, part of neoliberalism to do that. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, this is quite an important question, the way you put it, like when you say leadership has to be put into context, because it could be something unachievable in your imagination, it could be something you do every day. For example, <clears throat> you know, I work in a kindergarten as a teacher. We're supposed to draw the leadership out of the children, you know, mm -hmm. so this is also a different kind of level of leadership, or you role model, or you sort of, um, you plan for them, or you build them with the vision and the creativeness. All of a sudden, the relationship with parents, you know, and with your uh, fellow teachers. So the leadership context can be brought, just really say why or why not. We can all look at that kind of, a, you know, within ourselves, mm -hmm. the world we play on a daily basis. Yeah. Which is interesting, because if you only see leadership as being this visionary, mm -hmm. You forget the everyday, the things that we, I think in early childhood, we take what we do as, we underestimate what we do. So something that seems quite practical or, or the everyday that we don't necessarily recognise that that's about leadership. And that's, that's really important, you know, that it, it can't always be about the visionary big icon, that it's the everyday moment where you step in and give space for someone to, to speak or to... To, to say actually this is unfair and help children, support children to navigate an, a new space. So, yeah. It can, <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, it can. I even thought about the fact when you said that sometimes as a feminised working workforce, I suppose, the, the sense that we sometimes feel powerless mm -hmm. and yet we're often talking about young children having power, mm -hmm. having agency as if they have the right to have it, but mm -hmm. perhaps we do not. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an interesting contradiction yep. there, in yeah. a sense. Because we're often keeping the agency mm -hmm. onto young children, yeah. but perhaps taking ourselves yeah. out of that. 
Yeah. Well, have a look at the graphics in different policy documents where you often see the child at the centre or the child and the family. Mm -hmm. And as educators, we're always outside of that. So why aren't we in the centre with the children and families? Mm -hmm. 